Well, we're back. We're live. This is uh, Energy 808, Energy on the Cutting Edge. I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Jay Fidel, who I have always such gratitude to spend time with, uh, with Jay. And I'm especially grateful and happy today to be on with my friend, Eric Gleason of Next Year Energy. And uh, Eric and I go back now going on, geez, uh, five, six years. And Eric's uh, one of the most Akamai guys I know in the energy field. He has uh, given considerable thought to uh, energy dynamics here in the state of Hawaii, as well as energy in the U.S. and energy across the universe, across the long and winding universe. So uh, thank you so much, Jay, for being with me again. And thank you, Eric, my buddy, for joining us again. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, hi, Eric. Thank you for joining us today. It it's is a pleasure. Thanks. So nice to have you on the show. It's it makes me feel young again, which is yeah. not easy, you know. <laughs> so what have you been doing for the past couple of years? Uh well, well, trying to stay out of trouble, which now that I'm not in Hawaii is a lot easier. Um, so I, I have two <laughs> jobs basically. I, I uh, you know, I'm with, obviously still with Next Air Energy and, and we, we've got a lot of stuff going on. So uh, one is I'm I'm responsible for a, a really a utility business in uh, 11 states in Canada, and it's focused on on high voltage transmission. So so that's one piece of it. And then uh, I have another day job, which is uh, I'm responsible for strategy for our uh, what we call Next Air Energy Resources, which is our, our renewable business and and some other things as well. So you know between the two. Basically, I'm very focused on on the future direction of energy in this country, and and uh, you know, moving to a high renewables uh, power system uh, as soon as we can, and doing all the things we can to to help facilitate that. You know, there's a lot of you know commentary one way or the other about how well the Trump administration has done or not uh, during the four years uh, just passed. Uh, I wonder, you know, how it's affected you, what your perception is, and how it's affected NextEra, what, you know, how NextEra has participated or reacted. Well, we, uh, as a company, did really well under the Trump administration, um, and um, our investors think we're going to do even better under a Biden administration. Um, you know, as you, if you watched our stock over the last year, uh, depending on, you know, the ups and downs and expectations for uh, both uh, the presidential race and then, you know, the, uh, the legislature. Um, every time it looked like things were going well for Biden or, or potentially a blue wave, our stock went up. Um, the Georgia Senate race, um, you know, just outcome was like a 5% bump in our stock price. And so, so, so what's happening is, Basically, our, our you know our biggest business is renewable energy, and renewable energy does well regardless of whether Republicans or Democrats are, are running the government. And so, even though President Trump wasn't a big fan of renewable energy, the fact is, a lot of renewable energy was was being installed in this country, and and so we were doing well. Uh, but I think with President Biden, he's very focused on renewable energy, and so you know we expect to do even better. Yeah, you know, there there are um, you know the AOC crowd in Congress and the New Green Deal and all that. You, you would you. I'm not sure where he's going to wind up because it's not yet settled exactly how green he's going to get. But, but query, you know, how green do you think he will get, and how will how will that affect? I mean, could it be that we really move, you know, roll up our sleeves and move into green energy big time here in the next year or two? Well, we know the Biden energy plan because he published it, and it's even more aggressive than Hawaii's plan. Uh, the, the Biden energy plan is a zero carbon power system across the country by 2035 um, and net zero emissions economy wide by 2050, which I think isn't I think is in line with Hawaii. But the, but the power you know, ambition is about 10 years accelerated from from what Hawaii has set. Now, that's that's his that's his plan. Um, I think even with a, a a strong majority in the Senate and all the so so no real impediments to getting the plan um, enacted in law because it'll need it'll need legislation to really happen on that kind of time frame. Uh, it would be a challenge. It would it would be possible, but a challenge. I think uh, with with um, you know a divided Senate, um, 
it's it's that's going to be tough. I think that's not that's not our expectation. Uh, but I think the goal is is uh, is noteworthy. Uh, it's it's certainly the most aggressive um, uh, plan and and targets by by any president of any party you know in our history. And um, uh, and we think just based on economics, e- even if you know renewables don't come in to that degree that soon they're coming and we expect that um, there's not going to be a lot of carbon emitting generation left in this country over the Mm. next couple of decades. Mm. I wonder, you know, if you look um, across the pond, so to speak, and to Asia and make comparison about how things are doing or may do here, um, are they ahead of us, behind us? Do they have the same issues? Um, Do they have the same aspirations? Uh, Where are we globally on this? Yeah, I, so I think, um, so I think there's a couple ways to answer that. First of all, I think just in terms of actually getting renewable energy done, um, right now our our countries, um, we can hold our heads high. All right, as, as a for instance, and this is just one example, not to sort of beat our drum too much, but you know, Next Air Energy is the largest, the largest power and renewable energy company in the world. And all we do is focused on the U.S. a little bit in Canada. And so, you know, there's lots of giant energy companies around the world, lots of people focused on renewable energy, but no, one, no one's bigger than we are. So th- that doesn't say, I'm not saying that to talk so much about Next Era Energy. It just says that our companies, or our countries doing a lot of renewable energy. And um, so, so that's, one, that's one way of looking at it. I think where we're behind is, is in terms of having a national goal for when we want to be at zero um, carbon emissions, zero gr- or zero, even better, zero greenhouse gas emissions, net zero. Um, most advanced, most developed economies in the world have adopted a goal of around 2050 for net zero emissions. And, and we don't have anything in statute or otherwise um, uh, you know, the individual states do, but as a country, we, we've really been a laggard. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, during during uh, the Biden um, uh, administration that, that we'll see that. Uh, that would be great to kind of join the rank of leading leading countries and, and all, frankly, almost, almost all developed countries in, in recognizing that we need to do something about climate change. And let's let's start with the things we can control which is, you know, the energy system and then the economy as a whole. Yeah, well, um, your point about um, Next Era being, you know, the biggest, I, I guess it's, um, it's, it's also, because it's the biggest, it's also influential, if you will, in the, in a, in the energy sector. And uh, there's a certain amount of leadership going on, national leadership from, from uh, business, from Next Era. Uh, what, what is... What is Next Era's special sauce, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not gonna, th- that's a great question. I, I'm not gonna do it justice. Um, I will say, I think we were fortunate in recognizing early, uh, getting into the renewable business early. So we really got into the business in earnest about 20 years ago. And that was key. And, and then we, we were consistent. We, we never stopped plugging away, getting better, learning, adapting. Um, I, I, you know, we, at this point, we've developed a suite of, I guess, you know, strengths, things like you know, our, our financial capabilities and you know, the team we have and people and the culture and all that. But, but I think it really started with getting in early and sticking to it. Um, and, and there's certainly, you know, it's not like, we're the only folks in the renewable business. I mean, it's a there's it's a it's a very fragmented inter- industry today, and uh, a lot of people are coming into it all the time because uh, you know people can see the growth. A- anyone can see that this is a growing industry. It's important. Uh, there's a lot of um, socially responsible capital. Um, you know, environmentally we call it environmental, social, and governance or ESG oriented capital that. Um, you would love to put money to work in renewables. So there's no shortage of people uh, in the business and certainly no shortage of competitors that we have. But, but I think because we got in early, it's, it's given us a leg up. You know, a few weeks ago, we heard from the intelligence agencies that Russia had, had hacked not only our 
federal government and various agencies within the government, but also large companies. Um, and I wonder if, you know, if that's a concern for you, either you know, in the course of this current revelation or going forward, because we are, we are as you suggest, we are very dependent, increasingly so, on um, good energy, re re reliable energy and so forth, and it drives our economy. We all know that. So query, how much of a concern would you have, would Nextera have about um, you know, this initiative, probably by Russia, I would say by Russia, uh, to hack our systems? Uh, I would say uh, it, it is a huge focus of, in our company uh, at all the way up to, to Jim Robo, our CEO, and, and really in the industry, we're not unique. Cybersecurity uh, is something we, we've, we've all understood. Um, you know, I, I guess I've been, I've been personally uh, pretty cognizant of it for, you know, six or seven years. And I'm sure there are others here who've been focused on it longer than that. But, you know, China, Russia, and other state agencies clearly are targeting our power systems as a way to totally disable our economy and our society. When you, when you think about it, um, you, could, you could debate whether water or electricity is the most essential of essential services, right? You could debate because we obviously need water to live, but without electricity, you're not going to have running water at your home. Um, and so it's, it'd be very tempting for someone who, who uh, for a country, for a state actor that has bad intentions towards the United States to want to cripple our power system. Um, and you've seen you've seen utilities have their have their systems hacked or penetrated, and so uh, I can tell you it's a, it's a major focus in our in our in our company. Um, I don't know that anyone's ever really totally safe from that, um, but but you know we certainly are doing everything we can to make it very difficult for someone to do that here. I appreciate that, Marco. You must have a, a whole bunch of questions uh, that you want to pro propose uh, propound uh, to Eric. So. Let's have at it. Sorry, Thank Eric. You. Thank you. God knows what follows oh, please, now. Jay, yeah. don't, don't do this to me. <laughs> I thought we were friends. <laughs> I'd like to uh, steer us back to uh, the beautiful Hawaii Island chain here where uh, two of the three of us are. And because uh, uh, Eric, I'm sure has a, a number of uh, very interesting things to uh, insight to provide. So we had uh, this performance-based regulation, which uh, the decision and order was issued by our Hawaii PUC on December 23rd. Uh, last week, Monday on the 4th of January, Hawaiian Electric filed a 95-page motion essentially for clarification and, and, or, and or reconsideration. And I'd like to ask you, Eric, uh, first of all, if you could kind of give us the basic primer about what PBR is, uh, how it differs than the, or differs from the, the current uh, longstanding regime of uh, cost of services a model typically for investor owned utilities and why, if any, uh, why should we care? Is it a big deal, mid 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 middling deal or, or, or a small deal? So take it away. Uh, well, well, let me start. Uh, and I know that folks who watch this show uh, are, are more, uh, I'll say energy wonkish type of uh, group of folks. So that, that's good because it's hard to have this conversation and not be a little wonkish. Um, I, I think, so I have read, I've read the order. Um, uh, and, you know, and I understand that there's obviously there, there is this um, uh, pushback from Hawaiian Electric on some elements. So, you know, setting that aside, that, that's related to where you set the bar for, for cost reductions going forward for the utility. So let, let's set that aside. Um, I thought I was impressed by the order. I was I was uh, pleasantly surprised, and and I have a lot of respect for the, the the commissioners and the folks at the commission. But I still didn't expect them to uh, come up with 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 what they did. Um, I thought it was very innovative, and uh, we'll 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 come back to your first couple questions. But but I think really the bottom line is. Um, <laughs> To some extent, the, the, the truth is you don't really know if it was if it was a great order and a great if it's a great framework until you get down the road and you actually see how it worked because it's quite innovative. But my sense is um, uh, that that people in Hawaii who care about energy should be very happy with this order um, or with this framework that that um, the commission and stakeholders have come up with. 
uh, it seems uh, uh, like they've really tried to find win-wins, uh, which which we don't see a lot in in our country in the way we regulate utilities, and this gets to what it does. So so typically the way the way rates are set, you know, let's go back to the basics. You know, utilities are are viewed as natural monopolies, and so in, in return for getting a franchise to to provide service. Uh, the rates have to be regulated because otherwise they could charge whatever they wanted, right? We all need electricity. So, so uh, the rates are regulated and, and the system we've evolved in this country is, is the, gen- the general system is called cost of service regulation. So, so whatever the, the utility has to go into the regulator and say, here's my costs and I need my revenues to be set at a level that will allow me to re- recoup my costs, including a return. Uh, on my investment for my investors. And, and that's the general way that regulation works. Um, and it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a setup that served, um, you know, our country well for, um, you know, something like a hundred years. Uh, so, so it's proven, uh, but over the last 30 years or so, there have been um, some innovations in terms of trying to find a way to not just focus on the cost and setting the revenues to the cost, but providing some more incentives for the utility to, to maybe reduce their costs or maybe achieve some other policy or other objectives um, and, and give them really more skin in the game in terms of their performance. So that's what performance-based rate making is. And that, that's what it aspires to do. And um, you know, I, w- I would say just as a philosophical point, that there is no, tr- there is no, I have never seen in my career and I, you know, I, I'm responsible for 12, rate regulated utilities and been doing this for a while. I've never seen in my career a pure cost of service utility where the perform where the performance of the utility didn't matter. And I've never seen, you know, and I'm familiar with places like the UK where, where they've really were early pioneers in this. I've never seen a pure performance-based rate making regime where the cost of service of the utility didn't matter. So to some extent, these are ideals that don't exist, but but most utilities are more at the cost of service end. And I think what, what the commission in Hawaii is doing is, is taking HECO more to the performance-based end of the spectrum. Um, it's interesting because what it's gonna do is incentivize the utility to be much more focused on cost. And then in addition to deliver, you know, uh, roughly 10 or 12 um, other metrics that will can enable them to actually make more money or less money depending on how they do. So, you know, if you, if you think that the cost of your, of your electricity is important and you think that some of these other um, goals like, you know, renewable integration or reliability or what have you are important, then, you know, I think you should feel good about this, about this, this new approach. Does that, did that answer your question, Marco? It did, I guess. Um... Maybe you could elaborate a little bit on why you believe that it is truly a, a win-win or why you believe that as it, and, and granted, we, we're just the beginning. Well, not quite at the beginning. We're a ways into it. Uh, but we're, we haven't seen the implementation of PBR yet. That will be unfolding over the months and years to come. What do you think uh, are the tangible prospects and benefits that will accrue in this case, to the 400,000 plus or so uh, rate payers uh, across the five islands that Hawaiian Electric serves. Can you try to, I'm trying, for someone who's not up on the, on the, the verbiage and the concept of PBR and cost of services, you know, to the average bill payer across Hawaiian Electric territories, what difference is it gonna make to them? So uh, leaving aside, um, the cost savings that that are in this, you know, being debated as to, that will be flowed through uh, to customers in 2021 and, and beyond. Let me give you an example, and th- this is really why I, I was surprised. I was surprised actually at, at how far they took this. Um, so, Hawaiian Electric, the Hawaiian Electric companies overall ha- have about two billion dollars of shareholder equity invested in their utilities. And that $2 billion needs to earn a return. And that return goes in your rates. And, you know, roughly speaking, that, that is close to um, $200 million of potential income 
to Hawaiian electric shareholders every year, which, you know, they, they put 2 billion of capital up, they should earn a return on it. What, what the commission has done is said, you can actually earn a much higher return if you can earn a much higher return, but in order to get a much higher return of like, you know, potentially, um, you know, 200, of that 200 million, you could go up 50 million or more. But in return for that, you have to find cost savings. And if you find those cost savings or, or perform on some of these other incentives that we have, these are things that are important for us. We want you to give the customers a better experience, or we want you to give better reliability, or we want you to do a better job of, you know, interconnecting uh, generators or whatever, whatever it is. If you do these things that matter to our customer, to the customers of Hawaii and the residents of Hawaii and, or you save money, you can make more money. So that in and of itself is not a normal thing. Now, now maybe you'd say, well, is that good for customers? It isn't. Well, well, I think, you know, and maybe I'm a bit too much of a capitalist, but I think if you give someone some skin in the game and you give them an incentive, you're more likely to get the outcome you want. And, and the regulators able, the PUC is able to say, well, we don't want to pay too much so they can calibrate how much of an incentive it is for the outcome. So the PUC is in the driver's seat here. And so if they're setting up incentives that, and the utility is signing up to it, you know, to the extent they are, the utility obviously is motivated. The utility is going to have to manage their business in a way they're going to want to try to get those incentives and everybody's going to be better off. That's the opportunity. And it's with cost savings, it's even better because the way this works is for five years, the rates are set. Then there's a new rate, a new review of rates. If the utilities found, let's say 50 million of cost savings, at the next rate review, I would expect that $50 million of savings will be passed through. So the utility has an incentive to find the cost savings. And then ultimately those cost savings are gonna be passed through for customers. So it's a balancing mechanism that I think align, to a large extent aligns folks. Um, what's surprising to me about it is, I, I honestly would, you know, I've spent a lot of time studying regulation in Hawaii in a, in a past life, as you know, <laughs> I would, you know, honestly, I mean, like the consumer advocate would be worried about every little penny. And I think the way our regulation rate regulation in this country works is it's it tends to be very zero sum. OK, if, if the utility is making more money then they're taking that away from customers, we can't have that. And this is this is a positive sum. This is positive sum thinking. This is how can we create win wins? Oh, if we're really clever about how we set up the incentives, we can incentivize the utility to do things that they maybe wouldn't do to the same extent otherwise, and then ultimately find a way to benefit customers. So that's really the idea. And I think they took it further than I would have expected because frankly, the opportunity is there. If, the, you know, if, if they've set it right, and I'm, I'm not you know, picking a side on, on, on HECO versus what the commission's put out in terms of cost reductions, but if they set it right, the utility has an opportunity to do really well and then ultimately you know pass through those benefits to customers to the extent it's cost savings so um you know i would have thought based on the way regulators worked in hawaii in the past and consumer advocate and others that people wouldn't have wanted to let the utility do that well even if they did an amazing job of cost reduction so that's what impressed me about it so maybe if i could somewhat simplistically uh, to interpret that in my in the Marco mind, which is the more Hawaiian Electric saves, the more they're able to make eventually in terms of return on their investment. And just as importantly, if not most importantly, rate payers will see, if not lower rates, stabilized rates that would be better for them compared to the cost of services model. Did is that more or less, did I get yeah, it? Yeah, no, you did a great job of summarizing what I blabbed on about for five minutes. It, it's not a given that rates will be stabilized, but, it's, but, it, but, it, but, but if this is done right, rates should be lower than they would have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. You know, Eric, is, is this uh, something where, where there's a, uh, the, a formula uh, a metric, you know, where you, you have a, um, a kind of an algorithm uh, where you can put all, all the numbers in and, and it, it pops out 
Um, and there's various factors and variables and uh, everybody can predict how it's going to work. Or is this something where the PUC is going to have to exercise uh, discretion in order to allow these benefits or not? Uh, so I think, Jay, the way there, there are some off ramps if, if things get a little out of hand, I guess I would say, if the utility is making too much money or not enough money and it becomes a concern. Uh, but generally speaking, what this is, is set the rules for five years and then let the utility go run their business. And so it's not just about, I don't think there is a secret formula because ultimately there's two elements to this. They're setting the rules and then there's the utility executing. But then there's a next step. And, and I've been watching, you know, I'm pretty familiar with UK regulation and they really pioneered this over the last 30 years. So what you're going to see, and I, and I think the commission's envisioning this, they, they kind of talked about it in the order, is that at the, at the back end of the first five-year period, they're going to look at what's working and what can be improved. And then they're going to tweak the rules and that'll set up, if, if they continue with performance-based rate making, that'll set another multi-year period. So it'll be a work in progress. But I think for the first five years, what this is really about is the commission setting the rules, taking a step back and letting the the company execute with the confidence that the incentives are maybe more aligned than they were. And yeah, and with the full expectation at the end of that period, and conceivably before the end of that period, it'll have to be tuned based on how well it does, whether these uh, you know goals are being achieved. Uh, one other thing I, want, I wanted to ask you uh, is that um, it sounds like you're studying it because it may be coming to a continent near you. Uh, what I mean is how, how, how much do we see PBR uh, being implemented uh, by regulators uh, on the mainland and elsewhere? Uh, yeah. Is this something that's sweeping the country or what? So that's a, that's a great question. And that is, that is one of the reasons why I've, I've paid attention to this. You know, Hawaii is one of the jurisdictions, one of the really few jurisdictions that um, isn't just talking about decarbonize in the power sector, but is really getting after it. And so, uh, so, so we follow it pretty closely. Um, I, I think, you know, I suspect that, uh, you know, uh, some of the commissioners from the Hawaii PUC are going to be, get a lot of questions from their, their counterparts at other commissions. Uh, because I think this is this, this, um, this version of performance-based rate making has some, some pretty distinctive characteristics. I think it's gonna get some attention. Uh, whether it is, uh, takes the continent by storm, uh, you know, probably not, I would say. I, I think um, the cost, the more cost of service, more traditional uh, regulation uh, has been around for a long time. Uh, sometimes it works, you know, a lot of people are happy with their utility service and, and feel like they've got what they need. So maybe why change it? It's a huge investment of time and resources. I mean, the, this process has taken two and a half years in Hawaii and it's not done. Um, so somebody has got to really want to make a change in order to, in order to initiate this uh, to this degree. But, you know, it's not, it isn't unique to Hawaii. I mean, there are other versions of it in other places. As I mentioned, there's, there's actually a more extreme uh, version in the UK. I would say Hawaii is somewhere in between the UK model and, and the more traditional model. Um, you know, in my business, we have a utility in Ontario that we've, uh, we've made an application for rates that's, you know, very similar to performance-based rate making. They call it incentive regulation. So, so it's not unique. I don't think it's going to take the, the continent by storm. But I do think it's going to get some attention. And I think in places, maybe in places like California or New York that have very ambitious clean energy policies, the, the, if I were a commissioner in one of those states, I'd be looking pretty hard at what Hawaii's done. You think this is ever going to be standardized on a national level, um, you know, where the federal government steps in and sets specific guidelines that would apply to all states? Um, I think that uh, that is that is very it's almost inconceivable. Uh, but if I think about it sort of logically, how could that happen? I mean, if you had a strong enough democratic majority in, in the House, the Senate, and the president had a policy like, like Joe, you know, President Biden's energy policy, President-elect Biden's energy policy, 
they might come to the conclusion that something like this, uh, but I doubt it. I think there's just a ton of deference to state rights. We have a very balkanized um, power grid and regulation in, in this country is state specific. It's always been that way. And um, we have a federalist system. So I, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, Marco, you probably want to ask Eric about uh, Schofield and the project with Bartsella, which we've had on the show here a few months ago. Um, and and what, what Eric wants to do, what Nextera wants to do in Hawaii going forward. You probably well, want to ask him that, Marco. Well, uh, I, I beg to differ. Actually, I don't, Jay, because uh, we're, uh, we're kind of short on time and I have a juicier question. Uh, first, let me make a statement before I question, which is I think it's really noteworthy and way cool that for a change, Hawaii is kind of leading uh, the mainland in terms of PBR. And typically we're followers uh, rather than leaders. So I think that is way cool. And my question to you, my friend Eric, is uh, it's been going on about six years since Next Era first showed interest in getting in the game here with buying Hawaiian Electric Industries. So we're six years past that. My question to you is what, if anything, in your following things out here, what, if anything, has changed on the energy scene? or not changed on the energy scene over the past handful or so of years that you have made Hawaii a particular uh, focus of your interest? What has changed in, what is, what has changed to make Hawaii more of a focus of interest? Now, what has changed in terms of your history with Hawaii, which is going back now five, six years, how are things different now in terms of the energy scene here now in 2021? compared to when Nextera showed interest in 2014, 2015, and 2016. What, as much changed as far as you can tell. Yeah, and so, so I'm glad you asked the last part. I mean, the reality is I've been back to Hawaii, but um, not, not really talking to folks about energy. So, so I'm, not, I'm not as close to it as I used to be. And so, you know, with, uh, with that caveat, um, my, my broad sense is there was a period of time um, from about 2008 when, when uh, deco the decoupling docket started until, you know, 2014, when, uh, when we showed up uh, publicly with Hawaiian Electric and then, uh, and then Mina Marita left the commission shortly after that. During that period of time, the focus of the commission was um, finding ways to, to, to basically encourage Hawaiian Electric to, to, um, to move towards renewable energy, right? Because before that, and I, you know, I, I wasn't that close to it, but from talking to folks, you know, really they, they, they weren't that interested. And so I think um, that was a very fertile time for the commission in terms of new initiatives, uh, the PBR docket, and um, just encouraging, encouraging the utility. And I think, you know, the utility responded. There was obviously a lot of, um, uh, you know, up, uproar maybe over, over the, the merger and, the, and that uh, sort of was a bit of a distraction for a while. But I think, you know, overall, Hawaiian Electric has responded. They, they've talked a lot and I think they've done a lot around transformation. And my sense is that during that period from say 2014 to, and remember 2014 is when the commission published their inclinations and challenged the utility to develop a sustainable business model. My sense is from that time uh, until, until basically the last year or so, last couple of years, and really Jay Griffin joining the commission and the commission totally changing over during that time, uh, my sense is, you know, and maybe I wasn't close enough to it, but like under, under Chair Awasi, I don't think they were very focused on new regulatory initiatives and really, really moving the ball. But, but you know, the utility to their credit was, was working on their transformation. Um, I think now you've got a commission again for the first time in a long time that is very focused on using all the tools at its disposal to encourage Hawaii's continued transformation and, and including the utility. And so, I just feel like you've got a commission now with some real thought leadership that that is worthy of notice, you know, and, and discussion on the mainland that, that others could potentially learn from. That that's that's really what I see. Well, that takes me right back to the question that I <clears throat> that I thought that Marco might ask you, but I'll ask you. 
Um, you, we know that uh, you've worked on uh, the, um, the Hawaiian Electric facility in Schofield, um, and Vartzilla has worked on that too, out of uh, Helsinki. And I wonder, you know, uh, what what that has been for you, and what other what other uh, projects might um, uh, next era do in the future in Hawaii. So, so we actually, uh, other than during the merger and kind of being familiar with it, we really didn't have any role with uh, the Schofield project. And and I say that despite my first time in Hawaii, I was actually at Schofield Barracks with the Army, so I have fond <laughs> memories. That takes it. Uh, we we do have we we have some solar projects in, in, on Oahu that are that are operating today. So so we do have some uh, ongoing operations, I guess I would say in Hawaii. Uh, sorry, what was the rest of your question? What do you plan to do here? Anything more? Oh, what do we? Yeah, I, I think um, we're look we're a big player in the renewable energy business. Hawaii is very very serious about moving to a hundred percent. Clean, clean power, and ultimately a zero carbon economy. Um, we're gonna, you know, we've never stopped um, being open to doing business in Hawaii where, where it makes sense. So, you know, we'll, we'll I, I would expect over time you'll see us do more renewable projects. Great, I think we're out of time, Marco. So, Marco, why don't you take the lead on on saying thanks and farewell to Eric Gleason of uh, Next Era Energy. Well, thank you and farewell, Terry Gleason from Next Year Energy. It's always uh, <laughs> always such a pleasure. And uh, I, I really hope we can get you back on before too long because uh, I think I know the energy situation out here, the energy dynamic, the energy scene is in fact very dynamic. And it is so uh, way cool to have uh, somebody like you, Eric, uh, join us and give your both kind of insider combination, insider and outsider perspective, which... Uh, relatively uh, few people that uh, I know can can do so mahalo nui for your time today and uh, may um, all go well for the rest of your evening there in uh, in beautiful Florida thank you thank Eric you. it's great to have you on the show we go back you know and we really appreciate your interest in Hawaii thanks guys always a pleasure aloha bye